Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have a new CAT seminar. Uh, it's, it will be given by Dr. Fu. He received his PhD this year from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with Professor uh, Will Spencer. And now he is a postdoc in Purdue University, right? Yes. So you didn't go very far away. You no, stayed no. here. <laughs> I would be that very, very often. That, that's good. And for his uh, BS and MS degrees, he, uh, he obtained them from Tongji University. Yes. And his uh, research interest uh, is goes into structural dynamics, fatigue and fracture, and structural rehabilitation with particular focus on vibration-based structural uh, health monitoring, which is really interesting. Uh, wireless smart sensor, which is something that he'll be covering today in his presentation, and digital signals processing. Uh, we are so happy to have you here today, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Hi. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Yu Huang. Uh, so do I need to move any microphones? Oh, it's OK. We have okay. microphones here. OK, sounds good. Yeah, so um, thank you for a kind introduction. Thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure and great privilege to be here uh, to make the presentation here. Um, so at this time, uh, my affiliation is a little bit complicated. So I just uh, passed my defense this semester working at STO Group at the University of Illinois. I'm also a research scientist uh, at Embedded Technologies, which is uh, in Research Park, so to develop, to, do, to develop next generation wireless smart sensors. So there's a strong connection between my PhD work and also uh, the, the products in the, the companies, kind of commercialization of the technologies. We also got SBIR funding to, to like, uh, support that. And also, uh, I'm joining the Purdue University uh, for postdoc. As you can see, this resilient actor terrestrial habitat institute it looks very fancy. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we were like uh, uh, to develop some technologies to design the structures on the um, on the moon, on the Mars, something like that, and to, be, to make the structure more resilient. Uh, imagine there is some, like uh, the impacts from the uh, like maybe. There are a lot of complicated environmental factors you need to consider. Anyway, so today I will talk about the work I've done in uh, Illinois for my PhD work. So the topic is smart IoT system for application assessment of the bridge under such events. So because my area is structural engineering, um, so my work is more, more or less about the system development. I try to switch the focus to bridge uh, assessment to be more interesting for you guys because I know you are from. Okay, so I will give a brief introduction about what are study events and uh, why it is important and what are the, what are the challenges to be monitored. And, uh, and then I will, to address that challenge, I develop a monitoring system, which is called a uh, wireless intelligent study event monitoring system, which have three key components here. So I will go through one by one. And then uh, the integrated system has been successfully applied for two applications for bridge monitoring. The first one is the bridge collision detection, and the second one is train, uh, train crossing event monitoring. And finally, I give some conclusions. Okay. So what are certain events, like uh, earthquakes, downbursts, impacts, etc.? So most of them are very difficult to, be, to predict. They are unpredictable. And uh, they are short duration, transits, but they can be potentially catastrophic. So a typical example is the earthquakes. So in the last three years, several big earthquakes occurred in North America. And as we all know, they are very difficult to predict. And uh, the major shock is very short. It's only most of them less than one minute. But they can result in significant damage for the structures, result in casualties, deaths. For example, the central earthquake, central Mexico earthquake in 2017, uh, like more than 14, uh, 40 buildings collapse, a lot of bricks collapse, um, and a lot of deaths. So, even for those structures, so for those bricks, they are not collapse. They do not collapse. The public has still has a strong concern if the structure is still in a good condition. If they they can still like uh, 
drive car over the over the bridge, especially for the for the for the earthquakes that have a lot of aftershocks in a short time. So we really need a system that can perform rapid condition assessments as soon as possible. The other good example is the bridge uh, collision. So uh, most of them are bridge over high vehicle collision or bridge uh, ship collision. And uh, uh, the survey conducted by uh, research from City, Un City University of New York, they find that around 5,000 bridge collision occurs annually in the United States resulting over $100 million worth of damage to both public and private properties. And, uh, and the survey from the different DOTs find that over 30 DOT consider it is a big problem for their states. So they are marked in, in red here, so including Illinois. And because of their unpredictable nature, many of these events go unnoticed or go unreported. So the bridge owners really want to have, I mean, have a strong motivation to have a system that can tell them if there's a, a like bridge impact occurs, and such that they can like send people to do further investigation. So this is their two recent examples in Indiana and in Tennessee. So the other events, they are non-catastrophic, but they are also important to monitor. So for example, the train will cross the bridge, or the heavy heavy uh, truck will cross their uh, highway highway bridge, so they may induce large cyclic stress. That is important to to be considered for continued life estimation. Okay. So in summary, we need a structural health monitoring system to detect these events, to enable replication assessment of the bridges, so that people can make informed decisions in an efficient manner. So in the past, the engineer preferred to use wire monitoring system. For example, the seismic monitoring of pipeline, transportation, the buildings. However, the big, biggest uh, challenge for that system is the, the cost. So for example, Bill Emerson, Bill Emerson Memorial Bridge, the seismic monitoring system costs over $15,000 uh, $15, per sensor channel. In that case, we cannot deploy them everywhere, just the some uh, city fuel structures. So if we want to realize the, the, the dream of persuasive sensing, for, in, in, for our infrastructure, then we need a cheaper solution. So, what is smart sensor is much cheaper. The cost can be reduced to over uh, to less than two hundred dollars per sensor channel. That's very good, a primary solution. But there's still some challenges we need to address before we use them. The first challenge is the constrained power resource. For example, in two thousand six, research from UC Berkeley installed sensors, what is smart sensor, on the Golden Gate Bridge, but they were not able to detect any earthquakes. So the reason is that. The wireless smart sensor, they are powered by the battery, and they cannot continue sensing, otherwise they are dead in five days. So in order to prolong the lifetime of the battery, they are in general uh, duty cycle. They, let, they sleep for a long time, wake up and sleep, and then they wake up. So that works fine for general SHN application. For example, they, if they, are some, like, uh, they want to do periodic monitoring of structure, they can have a nice schedule. But for these type of events, sudden events, as I mentioned, is difficult to predict. So it's highly possible that when the event occurs, the sensor no longer in sleep mode. So they, can, they cannot detect any earthquakes. Quakes. So the second challenge is inefficient data collection. So this is a conventional way that wire smart sensor collect data. So after sensing completed, the sensor node transmit data one after another, and then once the user can uh, collect all the data from sensor nodes, they do uh, post-processing. However, they may result in significant delay for condition assessment. For example, uh, again, for Golden Gate Bridge, they took nine hours to transmit 1,600 seconds batch of data. That's very bad for rapid condition assessments. Uh, alternatively, uh, researchers have tried real-time data acquisition. Basically, uh, they let the sensor node uh, transmit data back during sensing. So that can save time to, uh, to reduce the latency. However, there are two fundamental issues. Because we want, we want sensor node to do multiple things concurrently, so there will be uh, scheduling conflicts for their simple, cheap microprocessor. And uh, if we want multiple sensor nodes to transmit data back to the base station, uh, they will have real interference. So these two issues need to be addressed. And because of these two issues have not been fully addressed, 
although there's some efforts for to realize real-time data acquisition, their throughput is limited. So they basically, for for example, they you, they, they consider there's a strategy of conflicts, so they, they just uh, like reduce the sampling rates. So in that case, the microprocessor will not be easy to do multiple things together. But in that case, the throughput will be reduced. So this the kind of a compromise uh, strategy. So this is uh, the issue for the data collected from the sensor node to the base station. The other issue is that if the bridge are in, in remote area, how do people to collect the data? So it's suffering to drive in seven hours to, to, to the bridge and collect data back and then to do post-processing. So we still need to think about an efficient way to collect data such that people can just sit in the office and download data for future assessments. The third challenge is sensor malfunction. So why is smart sensor are vulnerable to environments? Uh, by checking the one-year mountain data on Jinu Bridge, South Korea, uh, they, they, they use what IMO2 uh, on, on the bridge. There are 130 IMO2s there. I found that over around 35% data have different type of force, like drift force, spike, and buyers. So, and, and there are a lot of force there. So if we just use the, this data uh, without any data recover strategy, then we cannot guarantee that decision making is correct, right? All right, so in summary, we want our system to, for sun event monitor over the bridge. We want the system to detect events. We want them to do recognition assessment. We want to ensure high quality data, okay? But as I mentioned before, there are three fundamental challenges for wide smart sensor make these three objectives very difficult to be realized. So I propose the solutions to address these challenges uh, accordingly, including demand-based wireless smart sensor, basically hardware design, efficient network architecture, basically software design, and also sensor sensor for, for management, basically data processing. So I will talk about these three parts in detail. So the first part is demand-based wireless smart sensor. Uh, so the, chan the the objective is to address their challenge of power concern, uh, power constraints. Again, we want our sensors to to be able to collect high fidelity data. Although there are some sensors that they like consume ultra low power, but their data is not high quality. So we, have, we want our sensor to uh, like uh, capture high, high fidelity data. But in general, they will consume, consume a lot of power. So how do we reduce the power consumption? So the solution is to realize their event-driven sensor, or event trigger sensing. So that's already, I mean, very common in, in the market. So the basic idea is that, um, the users set the threshold, and if the vibration exceeds their uh, threshold, the trigger sensor will wake up the X node, the, the sensor platform, and then the sensor platform will start high data sensing. And also, if the vibration below the threshold over a certain period of time, uh, the sensor, the, the wake, I mean, the sensor will, will go to sleep again to save energies. In that case, it will automatically turn on, I mean, a wake up when the event occurs. So that's the basic idea of event-driven sensor, event-trigger sensing. However, by checking the power consumption, even if they are in these three modes, which means that there's no event occurs in this area or in this area, the power consumption is still very high. Considering that we have the lithium battery that has 10,000 mAh, this sensor can always can only work for one month. That's not good. So we, we do improvements. We still use trigger sensor, but we design it as a switch. So in that case, when there's no events, the switch will uh, totally entirely uh, power off the sensor platform to further reduce power consumption. And also we include real-time clock. So real-time clock has two purposes. The first one is it can record the time when the event occurs. Secondly, it can also support schedule-based monitoring. So for example, I want a sensor to start measurement at 3 p.m. today. The sensor will, will automatically do that. So this, this switch can be very uh, convenient for, for autonomous monitoring. So this is the uh, PCB that we designed. The, the key part is the trigger sensor based switch circuit. That, that basically the, the realized functionality of this part. So in summary, uh, the average current draw can be reduced to 0 0.3 milliamp. Uh, as I mentioned before, if we have a lithium battery that has 10,000 milliamp hour, it can work over three years. So without changing the battery. So that's uh, uh, fully addressed the concern for the limited power resource. So, and then we check the data. 
we found another big issue. Even we, if we have very efficient event trigger sensing, we still lost one second data in the beginning because of code boot. And that's very common for wireless smart sensors. And this issue can be very critical for some events like uh, impact, only have one or two seconds. So we really want to capture that data. So the solution is to use the data from trigger sensor. But it's, it's not high quality. It's cheap, it's low quality. As you can see, it covered the initial uh, like data loss, but it doesn't match very well with the reference data. It doesn't have very accurate sampling rates. It has some offsets we need to adjust. How, so how do we uh, calibrate during sensing such that we can use that data? So by checking the data sources in the same timeline, we found there's an overlap area here. So the idea is that you use the first part of high data sensor, uh, sensor data to calibrate the last part of trigger sensor data by minimizing the errors between these two parts, because ideally they, they should be the same. Okay, so, and then we, we obtain the calibration parameters like uh, sample rate adjust, adjust, uh, adjustments and also the offset. And here are the final results. So after that, we stitch these two data sources together and finally get the uh, entire uh, response data with no data loss in the beginning. In summary, our prototype can achieve uh, minimum power budget, low response latency, and without sacrificing their high data sensor measurements and uh, any data loss in the beginning. So this is the first part, hardware design basically. Secondly is the data collection to make it more efficient. So the first uh, strategy we call live streaming to reduce the latency when the gateway node or when the base station to collect data from the sensor node. So as I mentioned before, the first challenge is the scheduling conflict in each sensor node because the sensor node will do multiple things together like sensing, data transmission, and data processing. And they will be very busy. So the traditional way for wireless smart sensor to handle these tasks is first in first out tasking. So they, they basically let the task like wait in the same queue and they the later task will not be executed until the previous task is completed. <coughs> because of the uncertainties of execution time, we cannot guarantee that each task is performed at the right time. For example, for sensing, they may have some delay here. They may result in inaccurate sensing, so that's very bad. Uh, so our solution is to implement preemptive multitasking. So basically, we reorganize the tasks uh, based on their importance and assign them with different priorities based on their report. For example, sensing task, we, we, it is most important because we want accurate measurements. So in that case, we can guarantee the uh, execution time for the highest priority task. And for the task with lower priority, they will be uh, suspended. So for, for example here, they will be suspended and give way to the task with higher priority. And after higher priority task is completed, they will be resumed and uh, complete the rest part, I mean, remaining work. So in that case, we can make the best use of the microprocessor execution time without worrying about scheduling conflicts. So that's kind of the uh, optimization of the resources, uh, 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 execution resources. So the second challenge we address is real interference between multiple sensor nodes. Uh, so if, for example, in, in a large scale bridge, we have like 10 or, one, or even 100 sensor nodes, and we have only have one gateway or maybe two gateways. So how do we collect data uh, more efficient uh, simultaneously? So the traditional way, I mean, people already do is try TDMA, time division media access. So they let the sensor node to transmit data one after another to reduce the radio interference. So in that case, they first need a very accurate time synchronization such that they will have a very stable T, uh, TDMA schedule. And after that, the sensor node will take turns one after another to transmit data, so that such that at each time there's only one sensor node transmit data, so the real interference will be minimized. And uh, however, for some event monitoring, there are two challenges. The first one is sensing data. Again, as I mentioned before, we don't want to miss data, and for this strategy, they take 30 seconds to to achieve a high precision synchronization. Secondly. Because, I mean, after like certain amount of time measurement, uh, the clock in each sensor node, they will drift. Uh, maybe the temperature chain, they will drift a lot, and they, the schedule will be disrupted. So in that case, it's also very bad. 
So our strategy is simple. So we, because we have, we have preemptive multitasking, so we can add another operations uh, in between the uh, sensing process. So we let the, sen the gateway node to do time resynchronization periodically. So in that case, the, 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 the clock in the sensor node will be uh, refreshed or updated periodically, and also uh, the TDM will be very stable. And also because of we, because of that we don't need very accurate time signal in the beginning, so we can uh, reduce, uh, minimize the time for initial time synchronization. So the proposed framework can achieve 115 kbps, which is uh, over two times larger than the maximum value I found in the literature, uh, which is very good performance. The last part is how to uh, is to address how do we and the concern about how do we rebuild to address the data, uh, retrieve the data from the from the bridge. So how do we collect data from base station uh, to our uh, end user's PC? So our solution is uh, can I mean have these three components. Once the data is collected, the base station will store data locally in the SD card and non-flash, and then it will use 4G modem uh, to transmit data to the upload to data to the to the cloud. So we use Amazon Web Service, and then the user can just download data from the internet. So it's very uh, convenient. And also, at the same time, the base station will send text message to the to the end users, and so the end users can know there's data, and then they will check. So this is the second part, basically the software design. The third part is the sensor form management. Uh, basically, it's the data processing. As I mentioned before, there are three very common type of force that we need to handle. Uh, and then they actually will have a very negative effect on their post-processing, like power spectral density. This is power spectral density, this is the frequency domain, and the different force will have different effect here. For example, this, the drip will have the effect in the low frequency domain, and for the spike, they may uniformly increase the magnitude of PSD. So my idea is that can we, can we just make use of this effect to like differentiate bad data from good data? So if we cannot differentiate that, then we maybe the effect of the sensor force can be neglected. So that's the idea about how to how to detect this force. So I propose a three-stage measurement strategy. So um, assuming that the power spectral density from sensor nodes in the closed area, so if the sensors are very close to each other, their PSD should be very similar, right? And if there's some fault occurs, then this data, I mean, the PSD of this data will be very different from the rest of sensor nodes. So based on that assumption, I perform distributed similarity test to differentiate bad data from good data. And then the bad data will go through your network to further classify uh, the exact type of force, the drift, spike, and virus. And once we have, we know the, uh, the type of force, but then we can perform corresponding data correction functions to recover them. So again, so th this is three stage strategy from data, uh, for detection, for classification, and for recovery. And also you can go, I mean, go through again to, to check if, if there is some like uh, bad readings that we didn't capture in the first stage. So let's talk about the first part in detail for detection. Um, so as I mentioned before, I check PSD value. I compute a, a distant matrix and a similarity matrix. I didn't go to details because that's not quite interesting. And then I perform eigenvalue decomposition the first eigenvector uh, can be used to build uh, the index to um, to check uh, the the bad, uh, if it is bad data or not. So the criteria here is based on something that if the PSD are the same uh, between multiple sensor nodes, uh, their value should be equal to one over n, right? So if it is one of them is smaller than that, we can consider that one is very different from the other nodes. So that's based on the similarity test. So uh, I did a simple uh, example to examine the performance of our, uh, of our my strategy. So I assume that there's some spike force in their six nodes network. And uh, so this is the summary of the results. This is detection rate, and this is the sparsity of the spike force. Uh, and the different curves in, indicate there how many force are there in the six node network. So the summary that, in summary, um, as long as the majority of data is good, our strategy can always successfully detect the force. 
especially when the sparsity is larger than one, the detection rate can always cheat 100%. So this is one example. So the, we set threshold, we differentiate bad data and good data. The detection rate can, can cheat 99.9%. The second part is the full classification using neural network. So to, to, to build a new network, we need a database, right? And uh, so I built 8,000 data samples, I mean data sets, uh, uh, to, to build a database using the one year Tino Bridge volunteer data. So that's the real structured data. And then the label it's uh, using their, uh, I mean, manual label as good data and bad data. And then I extracted statistic features to, uh, which can be used for to, to, like, to identify this force. So for example, it's the drift. I use the mean square arrow, the mean square, uh, mean square value of that, and it can be very I mean, easy to see the, the trend of the data. Um, and then I do a linear programming that, that compare the weights of the different types of the features. If the weight of that is larger, it is very large, then you can consider that that feature is very effective. So I select 30 most effective features, use that as input of the neural network, and it has two layer, uh, hidden layer, and the last, I mean, the upper layer is to predict different type of force. So it's a learning curve. I use their database to test the model, use a five cross uh, validation strategy. So basically, I divide the data sets into five parts and use four parts for training, one part for testing. And then I average the results. Uh, so the average accuracy is 95%, which is very good. And this is a confusion matrix of the one test. That can be seen there, uh, the, the accuracy is very high in terms of the classification of, their, of the sensor. In summary, the three stage strategy can be successful to detect, classify, and recover sensor for ensuring correct decision making. Right, so this is the detail about the, each part of the of the system. So this part is the like the big picture of the system that I did. <coughs> so again, we have the demand-based smart, what is smart sensor put on the on the bridge. We have the base station to collect data from sensor nodes, and the base station can upload the data to the cloud, and the user can like uh, access the data by using internet. And once if the system detect events or detect the structural damage. Then it can send test message to the, to the end users for uh, decision making and emergency response. So next part is the applications. So first part, first application is bridge collision detection. So as I mentioned before, bridge collision uh, event is very critical for the United States and also in China as well. So in 2005, the giant bridge is impacted by a ship. And uh, the good thing is that their mountain system uh, this is the deployment of their monitoring system capture these events. So this is the data, excursion data they capture when the event occurs. So this, this is when the impact occurs. But the, but the challenge uh, point is how do we access the bridge conditions using this vibration data? So the strategy, um, I, I mean, the idea I found is from the paper that uh, basically impact force is, can be used as a very effective index to infer the structure damage. For example, the global damage, like global buckling, the beam falling, are strongly related to the impulse. And uh, local, local damage, like uh, crack, local buckling, is strongly related to the peak value of the impact force. So if we can estimate the impact force uh, using this uh, vibration data, then we can infer the structural conditions quickly. So this is how it works in, 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 in our strategy. So we. Go, we let the data to go through the neural network, and then to first identify the impact location, which is useful for bridge uh, inspectors to check, and uh, and then estimate the forces, and then use that force identify value to compare with the threshold value that user sets. Uh, you, this value can be obtained by nonlinear analysis of the FEM model, and then if the value exceeds that threshold, we can consider structural damage. Otherwise, the system will reset itself and wait for the next event. So to achieve that, we need first we need to build two models before deployment. The first model is FEM model. It has two purposes. It will build a database for neural network training, and the second one will help users to set the threshold for uh, impact force estimation. And uh, and also the second part is neural network model. 
So I will go through these two parts in the following slides. So before we do uh, main FDM model, we need to uh, pick up the test bed. So the test bed is in Muhammad Inmoy. It's a pedestrian suspension bridge, and there are a lot of boats go back and forth. So we assume that there may be a boats ship condition. So, uh, so we build an FDM model in, in the Apicus. So the, 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 the bridge is uh, 70 meter long and 10 meter high for the bridge tower. And uh, we do model updating. We let their uh, F, I mean, uh, dynamic properties of the FE model uh, to be very close to the test result. So the error is very small here. So, so such a, we can ensure that our model can represent the real structure. Once we have the good model, we do nonlinear impact analysis. Uh, so we, we build a simplified boat model to, to hit the bridge at different locations at, and also at different initial speed. And once the boat hit the, hit the structure, we capture the accelerations of the bridge at 10, point, at 10 measurement points. Okay, so this is one of the examples that we got from 10 measurement points, uh, accelerations. And then uh, we assume that the bridge is symmetric. So just to use the boat model to hit the half span of the bridge. And by changing the uh, initial speed and also record the impact force, uh, we can find the limit, uh, the value, the impact force that can can generate the structure damage. So by, by checking if the, the, the structure has some nonlinear behavior. So, uh, in, for example, for these points is uh, this location. So we use the bridge. And the, so for, for example, this is zero point. So zero point corresponding to the middle span. So we use the uh, the, the bow model here, the middle span uh, at initial speed, and if the, at that speed. Uh, the, the bridge has a very small uh, nonlinear behavior, but consider that that force is the peak, the limited peak force. Okay, and then the force value actually vary at different locations, and this is impulse impulse value uh, we, we obtain in, in the same analysis. So we can obtain that roughly the the safety area that if the impact of, I mean force is located in this area, we can consider the structure is good. Um, otherwise, we consider the structure is bad. So uh, this is so actually it should be like this. The, the, the problem why I use this uh, the square because it's easier to plot. And the second part is the neural network modeling. So as I mentioned before, I need a, a network to estimate, uh, identify the impact location, and then estimate impact forces. So I have two parts of the network. So the connection here is the identify impact location can include can be used as input. The next part of your network such that it can increase the accuracy of the impact and force estimation. And then these are the features that are used for uh, these two parts of your network. So this, this feature actually uh, is I obtained from the um, uh, aerospace engineer because for aircraft they also have similar problems. And they, based on their paper, they find that these features are very use, useful for impact location identification and force, impact force estimation. So basically, I, I follow their ideas. And then to train the neural network, I need a database. So this is a database I use. So this is, I, I select the different I mean, randomly you know, impact location and the randomly like the initial boat speed. And so this, we have 12,000 data sets for training and 2,000 data sets for testing. So this is learning curve for impact location identification and learning curve for impact force estimation. So this is a summary of the results uh, in terms of location, peak force, and impulse. Test the average test the arrow is very small, 0.3 meters for location identification and uh, 0 .0, 0 0.5 kilonewton for peak force and 0.01 kilonewton second for impulse estimation. Once we have that, we feel confident to do full scale demonstration. We put sensors on the structure, 10 white smart sensors there, and also for comparison, we put wire sensor in the hospital bridge, serving as a reference data. We use hammer to hit the bridge and record the impact, uh, impact force and also the uh, bridge response. So this is how we put sensors there. We use the magnets to put the to attach the sensor in the button of the beams. And also we use the glue to put the wire sensor on the enclosure of the wire smart sensors. So this is the data we got. This is acceleration data. Uh, I have 15 seconds data from 10 sensor nodes. 
we want to check if this data is good, if it's high quality, if they are synchronized. So we, we compare the data from our sensor to the reference sensor, so they match very well. As I mentioned before, the impact is very short duration, only have one second, but our sensor can still capture high quality data. And then also we check their performance of the neural network. Uh, so the error increased actually a little bit, but it's still in the reasonable range. So uh, as I mean, if you remember, the, the, the suspension will have handrails. The distance between two handrails is three meters. So our error can still like help people to identify uh, where is the damage, I mean, where impact occurs, uh, which uh, goes to which handrail. In summary, our development monitoring system can detect bridge impacts, provide high quality synchronous data, and present rapid condition assessment of the bridge. Oh, again, because here you can see if the impact force is very small, then the system can just reset itself and uh, go to sleep and wait for the next event. We will not need to, we will not bother all, uh, bother bridge owners to send people to the investigation. A second application, so this is actually uh, the force scale demonstration, it's not a real application before we just generate impact force by hours. So we also do want to do real applications, which is train, train crossing event monitoring. Um, so that's why we come up with the second application. Um, so the train, uh, real bridge monitoring is very important, and uh, especially when the train will cross the bridge will vibrate, right? And if we can attend the displacements of the bridge, then we can easily uh, tell the users if uh, tell owners if the bridge is in good condition or not. So the conventional way is to do reference-based monitoring. They use LVDT. Um, uh, as you can see, it's very difficult, it's very expensive to install sensors and to monitor the structures. So our solution is to use our sensors, which are wireless, and also it's reference-free for displacement estimation using acceleration data. So basic flowchart of the strategy is very simple. Uh, we we designed an FIR filter that can perform um, a double integration and high pass filter uh, concurrently, and then uh, we can obtain their displacements using the acceleration data. We also implement the sensor, uh, the, the algorithm on our demand based wireless smart sensor. We can perform real time data analysis, and the, the processing is very fast. Okay, And then we, we want to test our, uh, the accuracy of our, of our strategy. So this is a real bridge, but we didn't install sensor there. We just uh, uh, like captured, like uh, using the reference sensor to measure the bridge vibration when the train will cross. And uh, we record that vibration, and then we re uh, uh, reproduce, repeat that vibration in our test model. So this is the LVCB in uh, in our lab, and uh, this vibration of. I mean, so this vibration is actually the same with this vibration. So we put our sensors on the plate of this LVCB and then uh, calculate and uh, est uh, estimate the displacements. So this is the result. So as you, as you can see, our sensor node, which is X node, matches very well with the reference data, uh, demonstrate that our strategy is very high quality, is very uh, accurate. After that, uh, we put sensors in the real structure. We put sensors on the uh, Timor Trussell Bridge, 6 Timor Trussell Bridge, on their, uh, in, in the southern Illinois, and uh, deploy, uh, they are deployed for over one month. So this is how we deploy sensor there. This is leaf nose, and this is the base station. Okay. And uh, over one month deployment, we, have, uh, we capture a total number of 260 trains over cross. We estimate the displacement of the, by, I mean, of the, of the bridge when the train moves across. And uh, the maximum displacement of the bridge actually has a roughly a linear relationship with the height of the bridge. Okay. And also we record the, the displacement of the bridge over one month. We find that there is a strong correlation between the maximum displacement of the bridge and also the temperature. <coughs> so if the temperature decreases, the displacement also decreases. Otherwise, it would increase. Uh, All right. So that's the conclusions. So I developed a uh, uh, smart IoT system that can detect sudden events that can enable replication assessment of the structures of the, of the bridge. The, the first key part of the system is the demand-based wireless smart sensor that can detect sudden events with minimum power budget and no response latency. 
And also, I developed a framework that enables real-time data acquisition with high throughput. And uh, also, the data processing strategy to detect, classify, and recover sensor force that can issue high-quality data for subsequent analysis. And the system has been validated for two applications, bridge collision detection and train crossing event monitoring. With that, thank you for your attention. We have to answer your questions. On the first implementation, how, how did you simulate the impact? Simulate? Oh, so, yeah. I used their non-linear analysis. Maybe I'll <coughs> Yeah, so I used that to hit the bridge. And uh, this is non-linear analysis, impact analysis. No, oh, but on the, on the real... Oh, okay, we use the hammer. A oh, hammer. So we use the hammer to hit the bridge. But, but we, we hit very, very, very like, gentle. We don't want to <laughs> damage the bridge. Why would I get trouble for that? Even, even for that, they are, they are not happy about that. That's it. So um, you developed this uh, real-time, it, it is real-time monitoring yeah. yes. um, tool or software. Uh, coupled with the uh, with the hardware that you develop. So my question goes to you. So I, I saw your data processing. You did down sampling and filtering, but after this process, some information in the raw data might be lost. So do you still store the raw data while doing this real time data processing, or you just abandon the raw data and just store the uh, after processing data? Okay. So yeah. So. It, that's a good question. So actually, it depends on the purpose. So right now, we don't use raw data, so we just, uh, just throw away. Yeah, throw away to save energy and save the memory. Uh -huh. But if you want that, you can still save that. You just uh, create another task to, to, like, to save. As I mentioned before, we have kind of multitasking uh -huh. system that can do multiple things. Uh -huh. As long as the system, as long as the microprocessor is not busy, uh -huh. you can do that. For, for uh, say, real life implementation, how how frequently do you expect the batteries of the system to be changed? Uh, real application. So, yeah, that's also a good question. So, battery is always a concern for the wide smart sensor monitoring. Um, so, right now, as a maybe, you can show later. So this is how we deploy. So we have battery actually in, in the sensor nodes. Uh, as I mentioned before, it can uh, can it working for over years. But we also have solar panel that can charge the battery uh, frequently. So that in that case, we can like uh, assume they can work infinite infinite time. So. Uh, could you go back to twenty five, please? So I think that I was confused. So you hit the bridge at the mid-span and you get a smaller load than when you hit it closer to the supports? Uh, okay, yeah. So actually we we do find that, I mean, so, you, so your question is why it's smaller? Right. And then this one. There seems to be a trend. Yeah, like a trend there. there. Trend there. Okay. So this is actually the result of model updating. So we find that um, the component here seems to be should be weaker uh, after model updating, such that it can match well with their uh, dynamic properties. So our our assumption that is in this area maybe there are a lot of corrosions here in, in the bottom line in the bottom of the of the structure. I didn't show the photo, but there are a lot of corrosions uh, beneath the structure. So, thank, yeah. you. thank you for your question. Other questions? I do have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, so um, I'm, I work in finite elements, so I'm interested in the uh, that you have a good thing that we lost at 25. 
Uh, can you please elaborate more about the model? Like, uh, where did you develop it? On which software? What was the analysis technique that you set up? Or is it something like uh, it's already there, or you built it from scratch for the bridge and the collisions? What type of analysis did you use? Oh, so yeah, so we had, yeah, we used Abacus. the Abacus model. And uh, so it has different type of atomists, the beam atomists, the, the, the truss atomists. And, uh, and yeah, so we, I think we use, it's, it's, yeah, it's more, that's more deep. Do you, do you want to know Yeah, yeah, but well, well? there should be first uh, a type of analysis, then yeah. you go implicit or explicit. The static dynamic. Yeah, static dynamic. We we do I like uh, model analysis and also the dynamics. But this model is different from the actual uh, bridge. Right? Uh, this actually they are the same. The, the difference is that I didn't include the handrail here because this is handrail. This is doesn't uh, contribute to the structure properties. But does it have the same? Uh, I mean, for me, it looks more like. Um, It's more like the golden bridge and oh, yeah, yeah. this one. <laughs> this one is, yeah, so that's why we call, we call it the little golden gate bridge. This is small, small scale, but actually they are the same. So if you look at their, uh, their real application here, so this is the bridge. Okay. So this is suspension bridge. Uh, I think they have they have a standard. Nice, uh, but, but this is for pedestrian, right? Or is this for that's right, yeah. There are no car coming across. Uh, yeah. How does it? I mean, let's suppose like in this case, you don't, you have pedestrian. Maybe you you disregard them whenever you have the impact. I mean, you're interested in the impact more than. But what if there is a load and there is an impact? Yes, that's a very good question. That's uh, how we. Uh, and th that's the issue that we have when we do the test. When we do a test, we try to like uh, close the bridge, but people want to move across. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> They, 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 they complain that, no, you do, you do not have a right that, to prevent me to go through the bridge. Anyway, so, so yeah, so the, the solution is to like uh, adjust the threshold. So initially, I set threshold very small because I, I don't know uh, what like vibration will occur when we hit the bridge. So we set the threshold very low, but when the, the strong wind comes, there uh, people won't move across, uh, the sensor will always wake up. So, and then I, I increase uh, like a, one, a little bit and then even a little bit until 15 milliG for all the sensor now, they work very well. So, okay, but my question is a little bit different. So, let's suppose that we are working on the, the Golden Bridge in San Francisco. I was there, that's why I'm <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, let's suppose that it's filled with cars versus there is no cars. No what? There is no cars on top. No cars, of okay. Like at very late at night, which is, I mean, it would never be the case. But let's suppose there is no traffic on it. Versus there is, like, it's it's full. It's there is a like a, a queue. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened with the, the impact? I mean, how do you study the like the impact will have a different like if something collides with it, the impact will be different whether it is full or empty, right or wrong? Uh, but it does not play a role. Yes, I think there will be. I mean, at least the bridge performance will be different. But um, but in terms of the I mean data collection, uh, the threshold should be very similar because when we hit the structure, the structure vibrates, right? Uh, I mean the behavior may be a little bit different, the frequency component may be different, but the vibration I think uh, as long as there are big impact curves, the the, the magnitude that's why that, that's what what we are. Uh, but I assume if there is more load, there will be more dynamic effect, right? Yes, there will be more dynamics. So the, I think the, uh, the main thing is how do we differentiate this event with other events? So we can consider it as like a, a multiple events occur together, right? So you have people move across, there's another event occurs. So they're kind of superimposed multiple events on there, right? So the, 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 uh, I mean, there are the question that we need to address is how do we like, extract that? Um, so I think in terms of the structural vibration, um, if there's an event occurs, we, we can still we can always extract that. Even though this 
large vibration is not generated by the impacts, that still can be considered as interest events because the structure already vibrated a lot and we can assume that there's something happens. That, that's kind of, uh, I mean, our system is to capture uh, like interesting events and then to provide data for uh, virtual the first step. But, but let, let's suppose that the collision is done by something that's moving at the low speed, very low speed. Okay. And you're not expecting a lot of vibration from it. Right? It's just colliding, but it's like at a very small rate. Oh, okay. Very low so, speed. So your question is, if the if the impact is very small and then other events very strong, right? So in that case, you cannot detect this. <laughs> so I think yeah I think your question is uh, if, if the impact uh, occur very small uh, very slow right and the vibration without vibration are very small yes. and if that, there are other events occurs and the vibration like just sort of explodes so yeah I think that's a good question um, actually the answer is maybe that events that impact is not quite significant. Impact is very slow. I don't think they they regenerate any structure, like change of structural conditions. Like uh, actually, the impact is kind of the energy input, right? So it's kind of the, or maybe, well, maybe you can consider it as the impulse. So if their impulse is smaller, yeah, the, the damage will be really smaller too. So anyway, so I think. Uh, as long as the vibration is small, or maybe we can think about other like uh, features like strain or something else. As well, maybe it hits something that is like a weak point. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, anyway, that's a good question. There are a lot of scenarios that uh, we haven't like uh, have a chance to look at. Thank you for this very nice presentation. Thank you. Can we go back to slide 25? Huh? Can we go back to slide 25? 25, okay. So how did you determine the limit peak force? Oh yeah, so so I so for example in the mid span I hit the bridge yeah. and I increased the initial speed of boat and then to check the structural vibration uh, structural behavior if if I increase a, 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 a value that uh, generates nonlinear behavior or structure then I consider that is the limit force. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's very difficult to explain. So maybe. It's, not easy to understand. I, I got the general idea. Yeah, next. next. I think there's a question. I was curious if you perform testing at different environmental conditions. So, like the fidelity of data collection and the sensor durability. I think last week we had a record high, record low actually, for temperature. So, okay. if I were to leave lots of sensors all the way across the US, the fidelity of the results undergoing that seasonal variation. Um, on your sensor system, how would that influence? Okay, so your question is, um, how is there environmental factors of, I mean, affect our fidelity of the measurement data? That have? Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned before, water smart sensor is vulnerable to environments, and uh, that's why I need a Ford sensor for measurement, kind of to to do like a check of data, and uh, so for fidelity. Actually, our sensor is a very high performance. Uh, I, I should already do the test. Uh, very cold temperature. It works very well. Um, yeah. So, so the answer is, if if our sensor actually I kind of uh, like advertise our the sensor. Our sensor. <laughs> <laughs> so the sensor works very fine in different environments. And uh, and and also, yeah. We do need some like uh, post processing strategies to make sure the data is high quality. We can throw away if the data is not good, and uh, we can also recover the data. So that that's maybe need more like uh, of the data. Anyway, that's a good good time to like, think about that. Any other questions? Thank you so much for the presentation.